I'm really delighted to welcome to the virtual stage Lieutenant General John E. Shaw, Deputy Commander of US Space Command, the command which is responsible for conducting operations in, from, and to space to deter conflict, and if necessary, to defeat aggression. Lieutenant General Shaw is a Massachusetts native. He, enlisted, uh, he entered the Air Force in 1990 as a distinguished graduate of the US Air Force Academy here in Colorado. He served in a variety of air and um, space operations and staff positions. He's commanded at the squadron, the group, the wing, and the numbered Air Force levels. He transferred from the Air Force into the Space Force, it's a pretty seminal moment, in 2020, upon, upon promotion to Lieutenant General. He's a frequently published author, beginning with his master's thesis entitled Optimal Control Designs for an Inverted Cart Pendulum Array from the University of Washington, and all the way up through his latest publication, Sailing the New Wine Dark Sea, Space as a Military Area of Responsibility. Even more recently, an interview with Lieutenant General Shaw regarding the current space and um, regarding the current state and possibility for the space domain was published by Wired Magazine in April of this year, so you might want to check that out. General Shaw, thank you for speaking with us today. Well, nice to hear you. We can hear you just fine. Thank you, sir. And I just told them on a very small screen that hardly anybody can really see. <laughs> Um, hey, thank you for the invitation, and I, first of all, I need to apologize that I'm not there in person. I was planning a, uh, was to drive up to the front range and, and be there with you all in person, but uh, we had some things pop up, and uh, so I'm talking to you from our our, uh, our headquarters here uh, in Colorado Springs. Hopefully, you had as pleasant and most wonderful a morning uh, there in the front range in Fort Collins as uh, as we had here in Colorado Springs. So beautiful time of the year. I, I did I did hear that part that it's a little it's getting a little warm there inside. That. So I'm sure some innovation will be able to take care of that. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about uh, our perspective here at U.S. Space Command looking forward uh, with our mission set. Uh, what we see is the, uh, the uh, battle space that we are operating in, uh, the partners that we'll be working with. And then, uh, and, that, and then a little bit of time for some Q&A at the, at the end. And I look forward to having a little bit of a conversation at that point. Hey, let me start by saying we had a we all had an interesting opportunity earlier this year uh, to witness something that um, that many of us with a few lap, more laps around the sun behind our belt had not seen since the 1980s. And uh, it's uh, it was it kind of opened a whole new chapter in a long story. I'm of course talking about Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> Many of us remember seeing the first Top Gun theaters back in the 1980s, and yet we got to see the second installment uh, this past uh, spring, um, and, uh, uh, and and see the, the see the journey continue for uh, for Tom Cruise in that uh, in that uh, that universe that we see. But there I was. I was actually watching the movie with my son, who is. Uh, I hope I won't get any groans from this uh, CSU audience, uh, who was a senior up at uh, CU Boulder. In aerospace engineering, and we watched the movie. I thought it was a great movie. I don't want to spoil it much for anybody, but there's a lot of intense uh, scenes in that movie, and it kind of focuses on a on a on a mission at the end of the movie, uh, where the where uh, uh, Tom Cruise and a few other younger pilots have to go in and and take out a target, and it's pretty it's a pretty daunting mission to ingress to the target, to get there, to egress away from the target, to avoid uh, um, uh, being shot down while they're at it. And it keeps you on the edge of your seat. I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to spoil any more for anyone that hasn't seen the movie. But the movie's over. The credits are rolling. I'm sitting there. I turn to my son. I say, man, that was a great, that was a great movie. And he said, Dad, it was a pretty good mission, but it sure would have been a lot easier if they just used drones. Um, and he had a point. And that, um, uh, that we need to be using and leveraging uh, the technologies uh, at the very cutting edge of what we're developing uh, to help us across the spectrum of warfighting missions and national security challenges. And so the takeaway that I had to walk away from the way is like, yeah, maybe maybe it could have been a lot easier uh, if it had been done with autonomous machines. Not sure it would have been quite as exciting a movie, but it was definitely a takeaway. And so let's talk about a little more about how, you know, the real world that we're in today and 
how innovation is playing into that and why it's it's really critical to staying ahead of our national security challenges i said something about i was in a forum with a lot of other of my peers general officers about seven years ago and we were talking about it was in the aftermath actually of russia's occupation of crimea and in parts of the donbass in 2014 and there was a discussion about you know how do we react to this how do we keep russia from doing more um how fortunate we'd been that maybe they hadn't done more since putin came to power in the early 2000s and the the comment i made which was which sparked a bit of debate was the single greatest technological development that helped us helped us to curb russian adventurism in the earliest parts of this century was hydraulic fracturing and of course i had my peers reacting and saying oh there we did a lot of develops in the military front they kind of deterred them and kept them from from being more adventurous i said well no if you really look back at it if we hadn't had hydraulic fracturing the united states never would have transitioned from a net x importer of energy to a net exporter which is actually a remarkable development when we finally look back and see that and actually curbed a lot of their economic power to some extent there's still great reliance on their petroleum reserves in europe and we're dealing with that to now now and across the globe but it could have been a lot worse and their influence could have been a lot worse and their adventurism could have been a lot more aggressive i mentioned that to say that something that we didn't initially hydraulic fracturing wasn't invented and the innovation didn't happen to curb russian adventurism it happened for other reasons but it was an important innovation within our society that helped us in a national security matter so i think it's worth pointing that out that we need everybody innovation across all sectors of our nation and our allies uh, to help us not only economically uh, in other ways but also from a national security perspective let me brief talk briefly talk to you about how i see the backdrop in space right now so it's it's actually i believe we're entering a remarkable era and i wonder if we could go back to the 1400s with the invention of the ocean going caravel and other other uh, innovations that were going on at the time at the beginning of the age of discovery if we could have forced if if there were even if the general population had any inkling of what was about to happen in terms of economic growth technological growth and new security challenges at the beginning of the age of discovery in the 1400s and the early 1500s i feel like we could be on the verge of something like that right now with regard to the space domain we're starting to see a lot of signs of innovation and a multiple sectors interested in the space domain um, for economic for exploration for civil and for national security purposes and i think we could be and i think we could be seeing that again the very beginning of a big surge into that domain that will define a new era for us similar to the age of discovery in the 1400s it's against that backdrop uh, that you have now two new organizations in the in the uh, department of defense uh, united states space force a new branch in the military focused ex ex exclusively on the space domain in terms of organizing train equipped capabilities for us to use in that domain and united states space command our 11th combatant command within the department of defense and for those of you who aren't quite as familiar with how we're organized as a department of defense it's the combat commands that actually do operations and war fighting that are that are provided capabilities by the services and it's and it's our focus day in and day out to be prepared to protect and defend our capabilities in space and to continue to deliver capabilities from space for terrestrial war fighting it's an exciting job i like to say I'm, I'm a member of both of these startups at the same time so i transitioned to space force as stephanie mentioned there a couple of years ago but i'm also the deputy commander of this new command and it's an exciting place to be and it keeps us focused so let me say let me talk about three particular areas that i think we really um, are interested in how innovation across all sectors can help us in our broader mission set to provide transparency in the domain to support other actors within the domain and uh, to do our mission set and to be ready for any threats that may present themselves in the space domain the first is space domain awareness 
it turns out it's you know the the you know we you will hear uh, our counterparts in Indo Pacific Command talk about a tyranny of distance in the Pacific uh, area of responsibility. Um, we can talk about a tyranny of volume, uh, and in that the the relevant strat strategic spaces that we're currently interested in at least extend to the entire Earth Moon gravity well in that system probably starting to go beyond that in some ways. I'll get to that in a minute. And so that's a lot of volume. And that's a lot of uh, opportunity for us to miss things that are happening within that volume that we need to be aware of. They could be uh, natural hazards. They could be incidental hazards with regard to debris in orbit and or electromagnetic interference, or they could be deliberate threats. And how do we get after those? And so, yes, there's the physical domain, understanding what's happening uh, with objects, uh, natural or man-made or debris or active that are in orbit around the Earth, around the Moon, or in the broader lunar system. There is the electromagnetic, understanding are, are the signals there, uh, uh, what are they? Uh, are they potential unintentional interference or are they are purposeful interference? And then there is the need to really understand, once you have that as a backdrop, to understand a pattern of life of those active capabilities and using the most predictive analytics to understand what may happen next or to look for change detection in that environment. How are we gonna do that better? Well, we need some innovation. Uh, historically, we have typically done that mission set um, from mostly using sensors here on the planet. But as you look further out and we try to get uh, more refined, more refined uh, uh, understanding uh, of the cislunar environment, uh, Earth all the way to the moon and beyond, uh, we probably need sensors in space. What do those look like? What are the, what's the best uh, complement uh, of sensors across spectrum, across capability set uh, to give us the best picture of what we can see? in the domain. So that's one particular uh, challenge that we have that informs everything else that we do. We have to know what's happening in the domain before we can actually do other things. The next thing I think we're most interested in is the development of autonomous platforms. Now you're gonna get a great panel. I wish actually I could be there. It looks like it's gonna be a great session later today where it talks about autonomous vehicles. And I'm assuming it's all domains that are being talked about there. Um, land, uh, sea, air, and space. But I would, I would propose to you that uh, in no domain will it be more important to have cutting edge autonomy enabled by machine learning than in the space domain. And the reason I would say that's true is because again, of the vast volume of distances that we're operating in, we're gonna need platforms to be able to, they can't wait uh, for for human operators or even machines necessarily back on earth to tell them what's going on and what, how to behave, they're gonna need to probably do that autonomously, whether that's maintaining orbits, avoiding debris, avoiding threats, um, and, or con and or finding the optimal ways to conduct their mission sets. So I, I urge you all to think when you're thinking autonomous platforms, think not only the terrestrial domains, but think about space. How do we take that cutting edge innovation and capability and apply it to missions that we're gonna to need to be able to do um, in, in the space domain? You know, we actually, I like to say that the most advanced robots that humans have ever created are probably spacecraft. Those might be the planetary exploration spacecraft that NASA puts up. It could be some of our national security capabilities that we've been putting up. But those have been some of the most advanced platforms and in some ways autonomous um, going dating back to the beginning of the space age. That tradition needs to continue and we're gonna need those capabilities. The third piece I wanna talk to sounds like I'm capturing two things in one, but we see it as a holistic endeavor and I call it space maneuver and logistics. And uh, you know, it's, an, it's worth observing that up to this point at least, up to this point in the history of the space age, uh, the, the only true form of propulsion that we have had is something that relies on Newton's third law. We have to have an action reaction uh, um, uh, activity um, to propel. 
Now we're getting, maybe there are some alternatives looking at in terms of uh, solar sails and using the environment to some extent. And I think those need to be explored and I think there will be a utility for those. But I just want to point out that we're kind of, we're kind of um, restricted right now by the tyranny of the rocket equation. I've got to have mass to eject in order to move myself around within the earth moon gravity well and beyond. How do we get past that? Um, interested in any thoughts along that and any, any innovation along that line, I don't see really anything on the technological horizon that's gonna be a big game changer on that. There may be ways though that we incrementally get after it. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in DARPA's program, the Draco program and nuclear thermal propulsion on how that can provide us a new kind of capability of propulsion uh, that may be applicable to certain US Space Command missions, probably long dwell ones and or uh, 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 missions that require a quick maneuver on short timelines uh, with a decent amount of thrust and delta V more, and that will suit some mission sets more than others. But interested in that as a particular development. There has been a lot of work done with solar sails and that may provide opportunities for long dwell missions within the earth moon gravity well as long as as well as heliocentric uh, orbits that uh, re frequently revisit the earth moon system so there may be some opportunity there if there's anything beyond those that we need to think about in terms of how we can maneuver within and around the earth moon system absolutely interested in that kind of innovation don't see that on the on the horizon yet but that would be um, that would be a game changer I also want to talk about, remember, as I mentioned, maneuver and logistics. I think we look at this holistically, right? How do we actually have architectures within uh, the space domain that not only can maneuver on demand and in new ways and such, but how do we how do we support them logistically? It's worth pointing out also that since the dawn of the space age, we have really taken all of, with the exception of refueling um the space station, the International Space Station, to some extent, when we send up uh, uh, modules to help it help uh, to um, give it to get do orbit raising maneuvers, with that possible exception, all of our uh, satellites and spacecraft we send to space have taken their propellant with them, and they don't refill, or they don't refuel. That actually has not always been a lifetime limiter, but it often is. Now, in certain instances where right, platforms that are commoditized, proliferated low earth orbit and such, maybe that's not as important, right? Because we've got platforms that I can easily replace and refresh and propellant is not as important. But we will continue to also have platforms in space that are capital assets and investments. And we need to develop with that a complementary logistics structure in space that allows us to refuel, to service and uh, extend lifetime and extend uh, capability. Right now, our planners that are that are uh, uh, doing mission planning for many of our satellites on orbit have to use the constraints on their propellant in their calculations. They have to consider the delta V budget over the lifetime of a satellite when they think about their mission planning. That constrains them. That constrains us. I would love to take that out of the equation so that I'm actually unconstrained with regard to how much Delta V a platform can do in a short time period, because I know I can refuel it. I know I can give it the logistics it needs to replace it, to upgrade it, to keep it um, uh, a more dynamic part of a broader system, as opposed to kind of a static platform whose utility runs out quickly when it runs out of fuel or becomes outdated. I would say that just to kind of circle back, uh, and then we'll go to some Q&A, in the same way that hydraulic fracturing, I think would make a, that I make the, the proposal that it was a significant innovation that helped us in a national security uh, um, matter, uh, manner. That we're already seeing some ways here in space and innovation recently that I think when we look back, we'll see that they actually had some national security value to them as well. Um, reusable boosters have really kind of changed the game a bit. And like, like the invention of the Carabao in the 1400s, I still don't think we've, we've actually seen uh, the, the true impact. We're seeing some of it, but the true impact is still yet to be felt. And proliferated low Earth orbit constellations. DARPA, I know, is working a couple of these programs in particular to see how we can leverage these. 
but they change the game and how we actually manufacture a lot of our space platforms that will go not only beyond commodity like platforms, but also to, to capital investment kinds of platforms and make those more um, responsive and uh, built on shorter timelines and, uh, and allow us to, to, to exploit um, that, that uh, capability uh, with our future architectures. So I hope that was helpful to sort of lay out what we're looking at. Uh, again, we we're, we're focused, uh, we're grateful for the partnership we have with uh, DARPA and a lot of other uh, organizations within the Department of Defense and beyond. Um, but we uh, I hope I gave you an idea of some of the challenges we have and where I see there is some promise in a lot of projects that are going to be worked on on the innovation front that will help us with our mission set in the future. With that, I'll go ahead and stop and see if we get uh, some questions there in the audience. Over. Thank you, General. Thanks for those remarks. Um, I know, uh, and, and give us a little insight in what you're, the challenges you're dealing with uh, at Space Force. Um, first question from the audience, what is your opinion of the role, well, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, skip that. You sort of got it, got it that question uh, in it. There's been a lot of discussion about um, uh, uh, logistical issues and supply chain issues. Are you facing challenges on the acquisition side, not just resupply in space, but uh, what you're trying to do here on the ground? Yeah, so that, you know, that's a good question to read, you know, to direct to our organized train equip partners um, uh, that uh, hopefully, I don't know if any are talking to you there, uh, but there have been some supply chain issues. And but I think I'd like to just kind of go forward and, and be optimistic about I think we're learning about this. And I think broader industry is learning about this. Right. We can no longer find just the most efficient singular supply chain. You have to have a little bit of resilience built into your supply chains. Resilience, and I don't say that from a national security perspective. I say that from an industry perspective, an economic perspective. You probably need more than one supplier because things like COVID and, and other um, uh, uh, factors are going to come into play in the future. Uh, that true, that that prudent business planning is going to want to look for that, and from, we will benefit from that from a national security perspective. Thank you, sir. It's a question from the eyes. How in <clears throat> how is Space Command investing in next generation space autonomy? Is there a dedicated program or research effort you could share a little about? Yeah. So from a U.S. Space Command perspective, really what we do is it's actually a pretty fun job to have. You basically say, I don't have enough stuff and I need this. And we look for capability gaps and we tell Space Force and the other services and the rest of the Department of Defense and our industry partners and and some of our uh, and commercial partners and some of our civil partners. Hey, we need help in this regard. What I laid out to you today is actually part of some of the capability gaps that we're delivering from US Space Command saying we need these kinds of capabilities. And usually we frame it from a, um, at, a uh, at the speed of war, we need to be able to react and respond faster than a potential adversary. That's the capability gap that we can't do right now. How do we, how do we close that gap? And one of the solutions is autonomous platforms and autonomous systems. I think uh, when I say that, I don't wanna focus on just the platform in space. We're gonna have multiple platforms in space that are tied into some, a command and control system that also needs to have autonomous features built into it and machine learning and predictive analytics. And we will find that as, as all the discussions on artificial intelligence go in any sector that we talk about, we have to find that right balance between, you know, human oversight and what we allow machines to do on their own. I don't think we've explored that nearly as far as we're capable of exploring that. And there are many, many things that we could do that we could let be done autonomously as we're operating more complex systems further and further from the planet. Teasing out a little bit uh, your earlier comment about uh, space domain awareness, um, how do you envision the architecture needed to obtain an appropriate level of space domain awareness in the cislunar space? Yeah, so as I mentioned, first of all, you know, we can't, we sh can't uh, fixate on just terrestrial sensors. We need those uh, for lots of reasons, right? They can be large apertures and things we can put in space, and they're capable, they're, they're very capable, but they cannot do it alone. We're going to need capabilities in space to complement them. They're probably going to be in, in, in various uh, orbital regimes as well, including ultimately outside the Earth Moon system. So in terms of complementary, that would, there's that piece. Um, I would also say that we also don't want to do this alone from a national security perspective. We want to leverage allies 
uh, and partners. We want to leverage commercial and we want to leverage civil. It's probably worth a quick aside here. You know, I, I had a chance to go to Cape Canaveral over the weekend, hoping to see Artemis One launch. So there we were, you know, um, uh, looking out at it in the Florida morning uh, there, uh, Monday morning, and, and hoping hoping it would go because it was a beautiful morning, and, and, and it did obviously. But we had a lot of discussions. Why were why, why were General Dickinson, my my boss, and I there? Uh, because we support the Department of Defense has always supported human spaceflight from the, its very beginning. As NASA and Artemis go to the moon, one of the challenges that we will have as a as a nation is understanding that lunar environment. Uh, today, the Department of Defense provides collision avoidance for the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. We think that we're probably wanting to, going to need to partner with NASA in the future as we send astronauts into the lunar environment for long duration to do the same thing there. It's not quite as crowded, but it's not empty of debris and objects. So how do we do that? So there's a partnership there we think we'll do with NASA. It's just a microcosm of a broader set of partnerships that allows to understand what's going on. There will also be civil, other civil partnerships, I, I expect, with Department of Commerce in the future on better understanding the space domain for all operators, for all operators, not just national security, for everyone, to increase transparency of the domain and to uh, increase confidence in the ability to operate their safety. You touched on this a little bit earlier, just talking about how you send out requirements to, you know, to the Space Force, the uh, Space Development Agency, et cetera. But what do you think the role or of, spa of the Space Force is in the current and future R&D ecosystem? Sort of that push. Yeah, I know. So I'll put on my, you know, my Space Force hat too, right? Because uh, um, I frequently have discussions with, with um, my, uh, um, you know, my peers and counterparts in, in the Space Force as a service, apart from the combat command. I, I think I think actually Space Force is still, it is actually providing pretty good demand signals right now between Space Development Agency, Space Systems Command, uh, the Space uh, Rapid Capabilities Office. Um, I, I think it's growing the muscle to really be demanding and to really push the, uh, push the, the, the uh, other sectors of our, of our society to contribute to our mission set. Um, and even the, you know, the Air Force Research Lab has space focused pieces to it that are doing that same thing. Um, there's probably a lot in the audience you can say, well, I, I wish you could do a little bit more. I wish you could get a little bit more of that. I, I think you will see that. It's going to become a core competence of the Space Force to put those innovation demands on all sectors. Great. So, um you know, one of the challenges that we've thought about a little bit at DARPA and, and others, but can you comment on what you see as the main cybersecurity challenges for the space domain? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up. That's one thing I probably should have mentioned earlier is we, we cannot ignore cyber um, uh, security and opportunities um, with regard to our space mission set. So I'm sure some of the audience have heard me say it before. I like to say space and cyber are BFFs. We never <laughs> do anything in cyber and we never do anything in cyber that doesn't have some direct linkage to space networks and or technologies and or capabilities. It, they're just, they're intertwined. And so any of, any of you in your audience that are working cyber, you, whatever you are working on has immediate application to national security space, uh, uh, specifically and in general to the space domain. Um, I, I do, uh, I think I've acknowledged your question. I mean, we, we are definitely focused on cyber as a, as a threat vector to our space capabilities. And we wanna be on the cutting edge of cyber defenses to, to protect and defend those space capabilities. All right, General, I think maybe this might be our last one. <clears throat> when you think about space debris and the aspects that really keep, what, what aspects really keep you up at night? Yeah, you know, I, I'll step, maybe if I can, if I, I think I'm glad we're ending on this question. Mm -hmm. Let me kind of step out of my role in at US Space Command and even Space Force and just talk about, and, Talk as a, as a space enthusiast and a futurist. Um, I do think we all collectively have a responsibility to really look at this problem before it becomes unmanageable. And so, and that means any, any space bearing actor needs to be part of this solution. We want to make the space domain sustainable for uh, future generations of, of our, of our planet. And so I'm really enthusiastic about any capability, any proposed capability to first to mitigate debris in the first place, right? That's the first thing we should do, stop littering. 
if, you, where, if and where we can. And then looking at the most promising remediation solutions that really have to meet two tests, right? Uh, they have to meet two tests. There have to be, the technology has to be viable and it probably has to have a business case that closes or an economic case that closes. You know, we, we could conceivably come up with a way to clean up most of the debris up there, but at this point it probably costs trillions of dollars and it's probably not uh, worth our time. How do we drive those costs down? If you can pass those two tests or at least show how you're driving down on those two particular challenges, then I think we've got some promise. And I look forward to that. And, and I'll, I'd be the first one to sign up uh, for a very promising solution to that on behalf of our, of our planet and our future. Thanks, Joan. Hopefully some folks in the audience and online today will uh, come, come forward with some great ideas for that. We really appreciate you joining us today and giving us a little insight on what's going on at uh, Space Command. Thanks, sir. Okay, well, it's like a terrific forum, and I, I hope you have a great second day, and and, uh, and you'll, you'll have a terrific keynote, I know, from Dr. Hicks. She's terrific. Thanks again. Okay, thanks.